So today we're going to be looking at critical thinking and academic writing. We have some time together today and we're going to look at how critical thinking works and how it can be applied to academic writing as well, academic reading, but we'll see how it works. If you would like to follow me on social media or visit my YouTube channel, for example, uh, if you go to closelyobserved.com, you'll find all the links that you need. So when we start off, we have to ask ourselves this most important question. What is critical thinking? Now, originally, I was planning to put you into groups, but we have so many students, I think groups would prove a little bit unmanageable. So the easiest thing for us to do, I think, would be to work independently, but together on Padlet. <clears throat> so hopefully you've heard of Padlet, you've used Padlet before. I'll show you what it looks like. This is Padlet. So I have some questions for you about critical thinking. What is critical thinking? Why is critical thinking important? How can you develop your critical thinking skills? And why is critical thinking important in academic writing? I'm going to send you the link in the chat to this Padlet. Please click on the link, think about what you want to say, and then write a short comment underneath one of these titles. To write a comment, just click on the plus icon that you can see along just here, and you can add your ideas. We'll then discuss those ideas when we have enough to talk about. If anyone has any problems opening the link or following the instructions there, that's okay, just let me know. Oh, wonderful. A couple of students are already writing their ideas. This is brilliant. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hasib Rehman. Uh, if you could write that, which is very clever, put it into the Padlet, I would really appreciate it. That would be wonderful. We're already getting some very clever ideas through. This is really good. It's unfortunate. This is the first time this has happened to me that students have come into the room yeah, they, with this sort of behavior. It's yeah, they, they are really very, yeah, this is very disgusting. This is very disgusting. Excuse me, sir. Basically, these so students we are, are really you know, sorry for that. For... That's okay. Those of you who are here, you are perfectly wonderful. Sorry for, sorry for their disrespectful behavior, sir. Really sorry. That's not a problem. I, <laughs> it's water off a duck's back, as we say. Uh, we, we say sorry in, on the behalf of these people. Uh, they are very irrespective, sir. Thank sorry, you. sir. That's completely okay. Yeah, let's enjoy okay. the lesson together and the let's not worry about these people. Uh, family background. The people, they, they show their family background who are abusing Mm -hmm. Okay, leave it and focus your lecture. Focus your lecture, please. It's very kind of you all to say these things. Though. Thank you. This, um, the Padlet is taking shape wonderfully. We've got some really nice things coming along just here. Okay, so this is the Padlet at the moment. And as you can see, it is beginning to look very nice. Now, the link that I've sent you is going to remain here. It's not going anywhere. So you will be able to look at this again later and go through some of these great ideas that your peers have contributed. I'll just give you another moment. If you can think a little bit more about how to develop your critical thinking skills and why it's important in academic writing, that would be great. And we're gonna be able to come back to this later towards the end of our session together. Fantastic work. Really well done, everybody. This is really good to see. You've um, definitely got a good background in critical thinking. Hopefully today we'll be able to have a bit of 
practice of critical thinking, but I don't think that I'm going to be able to show you anything particularly new because it looks like you know a lot of stuff. Uh, you know at least as much as I do, if not more. So let's take a look together, shall we? What is critical thinking? I like this one. Critical thinking is deep analysis of any situation we face. Indeed it is. And we're going to do a bit of practice of that in a moment. Critical thinking refers to the evaluation of ideas or what you read or listen rather than accepting it as it is. That's really well put. I like that. It's a very nicely formed sentence, first of all, uh, but also it encapsulates a lot of what is really important here. Critical thinking means thinking out of the box, or in a nutshell, we can say that it is the ability to think in different perspectives. Some think it is negative thinking, yet it is not. I would agree. I, I think the problem that a lot of people have with critical thinking is that they think that it's very difficult to do because it's something that's very creative. But I don't completely agree with that myself. I don't think it's necessary to be very creative when it comes to critical thinking. I think you need to have an idea of the process and you need to follow that process. So when, it's a, when you say thinking outside of the box, a lot of people are a little bit intimidated by that kind of idea, and rightly so. We're put into these boxes all, our, all of our life, and to think that you can think yourself outside of it can be pretty scary. And yet that's exactly right. We need to do that at least a little bit. We need to uh, think outside of our own mental box uh, to be able to see the different perspectives. So I like that one. Critical thinking is that mode of thinking about any subject, content, or problem in which the thinker improves the quality of his or her thinking by skillfully analyzing, assessing, and reconstructing it. Critical thinking is self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, and self-corrective thinking. Wow, that's almost like a dictionary definition, wouldn't you say? Almost too good. I like this. I think this is a little bit more honest, though. It means to think on ideas and work on it. Very much so. The next one, though, says any information already existing in our mind is called critical thinking. Well, yes and no. Uh, if we think back to one of the previous statements, the suggestion that you have to look at things from a different perspective and that you can't simply uh, accept everything that is presented to you, then yes, we need to start with what is already in our minds. And if there isn't anything there yet, we need to add more to it. But we need to perform work, like the previous one says. We need to do some work with the idea. There are some very good things here. I'll leave them to you to read in the future. One person is very honest and says, you don't know, that's okay. Hopefully, looking at the ideas already presented here, you have a clear idea of what critical thinking is now. So a lot of this is really very useful. Why is critical thinking important? Hmm. If we want lesser chance of failures, critical thinking is so important. Critical thinking is a skill that helps us deal with different situations. That's very true, yes. Um, it's not so much that we want to reduce the chance of failures. I think if we go back to one of the things that was um, said to us in the, in the first column, what is critical thinking? It's this idea of different perspectives. Uh, as we'll see from the practice we're about to do, when, um, when we approach something, we approach it from the perspective of our own mental box. We see the world in one particular way. Now, if you don't work on that line of thinking, the problem that you meet is that when you take your thoughts and you express them to another person, that other person, of course, exists in their own mental box and they might perceive things differently. Now, when it comes to writing academic articles, for example, if all you've done is think about your own perspective and relate to the world as it appears to you, as soon as somebody comes to review your work or if it's published to then respond to your work, they come to it from a different perspective. If you haven't thought about that perspective then you might suddenly discover a weakness in your work or somebody else will discover it for you. And that, of course, would be what we consider a bit of a failure. 
So yes, that is definitely very important to consider. It helps you to think creatively. That's very true. Um, creativity itself um, is a very important life skill. And again, it's something when, when you say to people, be creative, it can stress them out. It can scare them because when you think of creativity, you think of artists, you think of the greatest uh, painters who ever lived. And you think, well, they were creative. I'm no painter. I can't be creative. Who am I? And it can be a little bit intimidating when somebody asks you to be creative. But actually, creativity comes from critical thinking because critical thinking requires you to take an idea and to turn it in different directions and to consider it from different perspectives. Your response to something in the world is creativity. Critical thinking is very important in the new knowledge economy. Very true. A lot of people claim that they have good critical thinking skills because they need to add it to their CV. But that doesn't always mean that they actually possess those skills. It is important in life. Very true. And it can bring new and good changes in our community. Very true. But communities themselves are often resistant to change. And one of the reasons that they are resistant is because within the community, people don't, within the community, people don't always have those critical thinking skills. Uh, critical thinking enhances language and presentation skills. That's true. But it is possible to enhance your language and presentation skills without critical thinking. Your language and presentation skills will definitely be enhanced by the application of critical thinking. Um, but I think that's more of a side effect rather than uh, a reason why it would be so important. It helps us get the idea of what is the other side of the picture and then the pros and cons of both sides. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, that is a very uh, important point, certainly. And I like this last one, importance of critical thinking. It gives us new domains. It's very true. By critically thinking about a topic, you might suddenly open the door wider and discover that there is a whole world waiting there where previously people had thought there was only one little idea. Think about the explosion of interest in science around the turn of the uh, the 20th century with the advent of quantum realms, quantum mechanics and things like that. Uh, up until the end of the 19th, heading into the 20th century, a lot of people talked about the end of science. He said, very soon we will have learned everything there is to learn. We will know everything there is to know. And then suddenly you had the, the first quantum scientists coming along saying, actually, that it's not quite true the way we see it. So talking about how you can develop your critical thinking skills and why it's important to academic writing, we are going to come back to those two things very soon. But first, we're going to do some practice of critical thinking skills. And again, I'm going to ask you mostly to use the chat to submit your ideas. And I will ask a couple of you those of you who have listed yourselves as fives, I'm going to ask you to contribute one or two of your ideas. So here we are back again at our little presentation. And here is our little topic to discuss. This is a photo that I took a couple of years ago at a football match. This was a football match here in Poland. And as you can see, the sky is dark. And that raises a question. Why is the sky dark at night? Hmm, why could it be? Why is the sky dark at night? Sir, should we answer this in the chat box? Please do, yes. And then I'm okay, going sir. to ask a couple of you to speak. Okay, sir. So why is the sky dark at night? Think about it for a moment. But remember the points that you raised on the Padlet. You take an idea. We know the sky is dark at night, as you can see in the picture. And you're going to take that idea and you're going to turn it a 
can think about it in different directions. Ah, implicated dust between stars and perhaps between galaxies. Yes, that's possible. Ah, this is natural. Okay. So, uh, Sajid, could you um, expand on that idea a little bit more? Let's treat it a little bit more. Um, let, let's take it a little bit further, shall we? Mm, because sun is on the other side of the earth, yes. When the sunlight doesn't approach the land, that area will be dark, very true. Excellent. So several of you have really taken this idea of critical thinking and you're applying it here. That's great. You're looking at a phenomenon in the world and you are giving an explanation for it. Could be a cloudy night, certainly. There is no sun or other source of light. That's very interesting. Oh, I like this one from Usman Naim. The orientation of the earth with the sun at that time and our location on earth. We are like at the other end of an eclipse, but we are on the planet being eclipsed. Very smart, I like it. Hamid says the absence of something usually gives rise to something else. In this case, the absence of light. Very nice. I like it. Ah, Mr. Mohammed Huzaifa says because the color of the sky is black. But then I suppose the question becomes, is black a color or is black the uh, absence of color? Mm, because in darkness, we sleep easily. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much. So I've got two of the three answers that I was expecting and hoping to see. And we're going to look at these ideas critically. And the first idea is the sky is dark because it's easier for people to sleep when it's dark. I think this was something that was raised in the chat. The sky is dark because it's easier for people to sleep when it's dark. Now, in terms of critical thinking, uh, this is um, this idea, this uh, argument that explains the phenomenon is misdirected, I would say. Why? Why do you think that this is an incomplete analysis of our situation? It's not completely wrong, and it might tell us something about the speaker. And that's always interesting to know. But I don't think it's a complete analysis. So I'm going to ask one of the fives what they think might be wrong with this. I'm going to ask Mr. Um, Sa Sajid, Sajid, and uh, five Sajid. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Um, why do you think that this is an incomplete idea? Uh, sir, actually, uh, our mind uh, have uh, uh, different uh, neurons. So when we uh, sleep at night, uh, if uh, night is dark, so we sleep easily. If uh, if uh, night is not dark, so we can can't sleep easily. Mm -hmm. Certainly. <laughs> yes. But the idea here is that we're going to take this argument, this explanation of something in the world, and we're going to look at it from a different perspective. So let me ask you, when it's dark, does everybody sleep? Uh, sorry, sir, I can't have any information about. That's okay. Uh, five, Fatima Khan, what do you think? 
So it's true, but it's not completely true because uh, in many parts of the earth, just like Norway, there is six months day and six months night. So people also sleep uh, when there is six months day. Uh, there, there are so many reasons uh, why the uh, sky is dark. For example, uh, because of the movement of the Earth, and uh, as uh, Sun is stable at one place and Earth is moving, when the opposite side of the Earth will be darker. Very good. Yes, absolutely right. And thank you very much for your contribution there. Hello, sir. I would like to add something. Mm -hmm. Please do. Yeah, I think this sentence is more of a cop-out in critical thinking because it only explains our side of perspective. Uh, it doesn't actually says about more about everyone and how the thing and actually is. So I would say it's more of a cop-out in critical thinking. I wouldn't That's say right. it's a sound conclusion. Very good. Very well so argued. Well question, sir. Yes, please. Go sir, ahead. Can I add Yes. Sir, we have to uh, give an argument about this statement written on the screen or the question that was asked previously. Well, right now we're looking at this statement and we're looking at why it's limited, why it doesn't uh, show sir, particularly the, good critical the thinking. Of night. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. About the darkness of night, sir, uh, we say when, uh, when Earth rotates, it's the changing of um, uh, day, and when the sun rotates. So there are a lot of reasons, scientific reasons, mm -hmm. due to which the sky is dark at night. That's very and true. This statement just, and this statement just shows the perspective of the writer, that it is night because it is easier for people to sleep. And... Uh, this statement looked like a prehistoric statement uh, before the science. Well, because yes and no. I mean, this is the great thing about critical thinking is that we have to take an idea and we have to look at it from different perspectives. I think that's very uh, key to the whole process. You're right that maybe it's a reflection of, well, I wouldn't want to say primitive thinking, but there is something to it. Um, we have evolved to sleep at night because it is easier to sleep at night. A lot of animals do sleep at night. We call them diurnal. And there are others that are awake at night. We call those nocturnal. We have the words to describe them. All creatures sleep. It really seems now that the more research we do, the more we can see that every single species of animal sleeps at some stage. And yes, we do find it easier to sleep uh, in the sir, dark. Is it easier to sleep in day? Sir, sir I, can I add uh, some, uh, something about... Yes, go uh, ahead. Sir, uh, as I think uh, that uh, this statement is not uh, completely true, because uh, most of us uh, sleep uh, at uh, uh, na day. Uh, uh, sir, uh, sleep is the state of uh, when somebody tried uh, from work, then they can easily sleep. If uh, uh, if the, the man of uh, if the person not try, uh... mm -hmm. you mean sleep is intentional something intentional yes, that whenever mm -hmm. yes, we feel we can sleep okay yes sir i think yes well okay. it is true that we show a preference for darkness for sleeping and a lot of people complain when they try to sleep during the day that it's too bright they need thick heavy curtains to block out the light okay so uh, yes, you're right in the chat there. Every organism has their own biological clocks. And yeah, we can't disrupt them too much. It disrupts our sleep, certainly. But looking at this statement, and this was a, an idea that appeared in the chat, and it is an idea that is often given as an explanation for why the sky is dark at no. night. We can see that there are certain aspects that are true and certain that are limited or simply wrong. Yes, please speak. Uh, sir, uh, my question is about uh, uh, when, sun, uh, when sun rotates mm -hmm. around Earth. Sir, it will take 25 days or more than that. 
Sorry, once more, I didn't quite hear you. Uh, what do you say, sir? I don't understand a new language uh, on your talk, sir. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear everything that you said. I think there was a connection problem. You know, when sun rotates around the earth, sir, it will, uh, will it take 25 days uh, or more or more than that? For, for what, the sun to rotate around the earth? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, the sun doesn't rotate around the earth, though. The earth rotates around the sun. It, it does. Well, the, the sun rotates, the earth rotates on its own axis, and it takes a, just over 24 hours for it to do that once. And the sun orbits the sun, sorry, the earth orbits the sun, the earth orbits the sun, it takes about 365 days for that to happen. Okay, the next argument put forward to explain this is that the sky is dark because the sun is on the other side of the earth at night. And I like this, um, the way of expressing this in the chat. Somebody said it's a little bit like during an eclipse, only in this case, the eclipse is caused by the whole earth being between us and the sun. So again, we want to apply those ideas of critical thinking to what we have just here. Let's take this idea and turn it, look at it from different perspectives. First of all, do you think that this is a complete explanation for why the sky is dark? Uh, Abdul Sami is saying the sun is, sun is a stationary Excuse object, me, which sir. is not. <laughs> yes. Excuse me, sir, can I speak? Please do. Uh, the sun is dark. Uh, the reason of uh, that, uh, the uh, despite the fact the blazing stars and galaxies shine throughout the universe, space pitch is black basically. So uh, rather than the being brightly lit, the idea was that the dust would block the light from faraway objects and making the uh, sky dark. That's why this. Uh, that's why the sky is dark at night. Ah, thank you very much. We'll be coming to that idea in a moment, actually. So thank sir, you for raising. Can I add something? Please yeah. do. Yes. Uh, excuse me, sir. sir I have one at a time. Is basically, the sky is dark, and mm -hmm. it seems to us that it is dark at night, and it is never lit. The light of the sun reaches the uh, planet, and that's why, due to that light, our atmosphere glows, and it seems as there is light everywhere. Due sir, to the I light of the sun, can the can sky see? basically is dark and an empty space. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, who was also Fatima, asking? Continue. Sir, Fatima Khan. Yeah. Fa Sir, uh, yeah, my perspective is that uh, sky is always dark. Sky is never blue. We see it blue just because of the ozone layers and the light that reaches the earth uh, and the part of earth that reaches the sun, sunlight. But the, actually, when we uh, see the overall view of the solar system, the sky is never blue. We see it blue just because of the sunlight uh, on the earth when we just stand here because of the uh, ozone layer we see it blue uh, and the sunlight that reaches the um, surface of the earth that's really it's good Fatima Khan actually. yeah you're absolutely right uh, this process is called Raleigh scattering um, but you're absolutely right um, the blue sky as we term it which is only blue during the middle part of the day depending on the weather conditions themselves is only blue because of the properties of the atmosphere of the earth were we to live on Mars Excuse we me. would have a completely different appreciation of the color of the sky who's next yes sir uh, excuse me sir please uh as we know that sky is dark but the uh, we can see that we can see uh, at that uh, day uh, the sky is blue because of the reflection of uh, uh, water when the lights uh, uh, when the lights 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I know what you're trying to say here, that the blue sky is caused by a reflection of water, uh, but we know that that's not the case. Uh, we can test that by going to a place where there is no water, such as in the middle of a desert, and we will still see that the sky is blue. However, it's not a matter of the sky being blue, it's whether there is light or there is dark. Now, we, we can agree we can agree that this argument, this idea that the sky is dark because the sun is on the other side of the earth at night is a good argument for explaining quite a lot. But what we want to do here in terms of critical thinking is to go a little bit further. And we want to look at some of the additional um, effects or consequences of the fact that the sky is dark. Is it always dark for the same amount of time? Is there always the same period of dark night and light day? And we know that there isn't. So why not? Why is there a difference in the amount of daylight that we receive each day? Uh, so that is due to the orbit of the Earth. Good. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Tell me more. It is closer to the sun. Uh, during the summers and so the surface area of the earth exposed to the sun uh, is greater very good and so it when we picture the, the earth, earth yes very good it's the axis of the earth when we picture the earth if we picture it spinning on its axis like this then we're going to end up with an equal amount of day and an equal amount of night and that's not what we observe in fact, as you've rightly said, the axis is tilted. It's at an angle like this. And this therefore accounts for the seasons that we see in different parts of the earth. Depending on which side is facing the sun for longer, we would get summer. And the side that is facing away from the sun longer would also get winter. And this is something that you get by approaching this statement using your critical thinking skills. That's the key point that I want to address here. And we'll see why that's important when we soon turn our attention to academic writing. There is one other idea which has been raised, and that is this. The sky is dark because the universe is probably not infinitely large or infinitely old. Now, some of you have already kind of touched on this, but would anyone like to give an explanation of this? So the sky itself is dark and the light uh, that we can see in there is due to the stars and uh, in our solar system due to the sun. Mm hmm. Very true. Yes, the sun is the nearest star to us. And therefore, when we are facing the sun, we receive the light from the sun. That's very true. But we need to stop Excuse for a moment. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Because uh, uh, here I want to say that uh, the uh, sky is dark, but in sky, the some spaces are present to which the light can enter. But at the night time, the dust particles will block the uh, spaces and light can't um, pass from spaces. So the uh, at night, the sky uh, look like dark. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, well, that's a nice idea and nicely expressed. But again, it's quite limited in terms of its um, universal applicability, because that dust, of course, would be there all the time and not simply at night. There is another way to look at this, of course. And that is to consider that perhaps the universe itself is finite, perhaps. For a long time, many people believed that the universe was infinite, that it extended infinitely in every direction, and that it was infinitely old, that the universe had, already, uh, had always been there. However, if we accept that interpretation then we would expect the night sky to be just as bright as the day sky. Why? Because, well, if we treat the sky as a field of pixels, like on a modern TV, in every pixel of the sky, we would expect there to be a star, and perhaps there is. 
But if the universe was infinitely old, we would expect that the light from that star would have reached us by now. And if it had reached us by now, then the sky at night would still be just as light as during the day. That's not the case. Even if you go to a remote area away from light pollution, you will find that although you can perceive, for example, the Milky Way, and it is one of the most beautiful things to behold in the sky at night, it illuminates to an extent, but it doesn't provide enough light to be able to say that the sky is now just as light as it was during the day. So we can then start to think critically about this idea. Perhaps there hasn't been enough time for the light from these stars to reach us yet. That suggests that the universe might not be infinitely old. This is the core of critical uh -huh. thinking. Somebody would like to speak? Uh, yes, sir. Please. So the light reaching us uh, now from the farthest star out there in the uh, observable universe, that is the age of the Earth, not the age of the universe, because we can only see the light that has been traveling to us from the start of the, or you can say that, uh, from the birth of the Earth. That's a really good point, actually. I hadn't thought of that myself. But the point itself still holds. If people considered the Earth, for example, to have been infinitely old, always here, and some people do claim that to be the truth, uh, then we can again look at it from the other direction. Although the age of the Earth here, I don't think is that relevant. But I do like the point because that's taking this idea and you're turning it and you're looking at it critically from another perspective, you are examining it from another side, like a diamond examining its facets. And I think that's really, really good because that shows that you're a critical thinker. Now, this idea, uh, this is actually expressed by Olber's paradox. So if you've ever read about Olber's paradox, this is the story that we're following here. Uh, this is a paradox that has um, interested scientists for many centuries now. But the idea here that I wanted to illustrate is that we take something that we observe. We seek explanations for why that thing exists. And then we challenge each of those explanations. And we see what happens if you follow the explanation further. And all of that brings us to the idea of academic writing. And this is the idea of applying critical thinking to academic writing. And we're going to now look a little bit as a, at an example uh, of this and how it works. Please go ahead. Uh, I have a question about uh, moon. Sir, why moon of 14 day is so high? Uh, once again, sorry. Why? Why is the moon? Uh, moon of 14 day uh, is so high. Its, it's lighting is uh, very high. Uh, instead of uh, other days. Well, again, it's a system, isn't it? The Earth rotates on its axis. The, the moon follows the Earth, travels round. When we can't see the moon, it's because um, it's on the other side of the Earth. And as the moon waxes and wanes, a certain amount of the moon is, um, well, the light from the moon is actually just the light from the sun reflected back to us. So when the, the earth is in between the sun and the moon, we don't get to see the moon because it's not reflecting anything. Um, so because these things vary during the lunar month, this would explain the, the variations that we see. So let's turn our attention then to critical thinking for academic writing. And there are two ways in which we can approach this area. Uh, the first way that we can approach it, the first thing that we can consider is what happens when we read academic writing. When we read academic writing, we need to make sure that our critical faculties are engaged. We need to think critically about what we're reading. Now, how do we do that? Well, first of all, let's go back to our Padlet and we're going to see what ideas you had on this uh, point earlier today in the session. Why is critical thinking important in academic writing? 
So let's take a look at those. Critical thinking gives us previous knowledge previews. Yes, that's very true. Uh, by activating our existing knowledge, we're more likely to be able to understand and process the new things that we come across. Um, in an academic argument, ideas are organized into a line of reasoning. Yes, that's true. The writer aims to persuade the reader that their point of view is valid. Very much so. Being able to understand and create structured reasoned arguments is central to critical thinking, certainly. And it goes the other way as well. Being able to understand them comes from that critical thinking. The writer has done a lot of the work that we have to do, but we need to do it ourselves because we are the critical thinkers approaching that academic text. It's not enough for us to read and accept what we've read as if it was automatically correct simply by virtue of being published. So yes, we can also use critical thinking to reflect on the, their own knowledge and information presented to them. Very good. And with critical thinking, you can take the most out of your academics and excel. Absolutely right as well, definitely. Okay, so I'm going to give us an example now of academic writing and how we can approach it using our critical thinking skills. I'm going to describe to you a situation and we're going to respond to that situation critically. And it's a situation for myself. OK. So I noticed a while ago that when I was learning foreign languages, such as French at school and Polish more recently, I noticed that when I read short texts aloud in that foreign language, my confidence in using the foreign language improved. And that confidence seemed to improve regardless of the presence of a teacher. So it didn't seem to matter if there was a teacher there to correct my mistakes or not. Over time, I felt more confident because I spent some time reading aloud. But while I felt more confident, I also wondered, was I speaking better? So, of course, I started to do some reading on this topic. Some people believe that it's a good idea to ask your students to read aloud in English so that they can develop their pronunciation skills. Others believe that it's a waste of time. Who's right? How do we find out? So that's what we're going to consider now. That's our situation. Like the sky is dark at night, we have this situation. Reading aloud might help people develop their pronunciation skills, but we don't know. So how would we devise a test to examine this idea? When we consider the sky at night, one thing that we can do as a test or an experiment would be to measure how long the night lasts and see if there are variations. This will help reveal a deeper truth about the sky at night. We could also travel to different places on the earth and compare our findings. We could have a look to see if the amount of nighttime changes depending on where you are. And as um, one of these wise students has already said, if you go to somewhere like Norway, especially the north of Norway, you very quickly find that the sun doesn't even set all of the year round. There are places on the earth where you have the, the long summer and also the long winter. So then the question becomes here, how do we test to see if reading aloud helps students develop their pronunciation? I'd like you to think about that and then to contribute in the chat. What can we do to test this idea? Excellent, we're getting some ideas coming through, that's good. Um, we can set a survey from which we would ask people about their opinion. Okay, yes, so uh, this is a very popular method of research, which is uh, asking people how they feel about something. 
the danger with that sort of thing is that people are not very good judges of themselves. They don't tend to think critically about their own perspective. Um, so, for example, um, when when you ask somebody how many calories they consume on a daily basis, they tend to underestimate sometimes by even up to a thousand calories a day. So you ask somebody who wants to lose weight um, why it is that they're not losing weight and they say, well, I don't know. You know, I, I, I've cut the calories that I consume. I'm doing very well. And you say, okay, well, how many calories do you consume? And they say this many. And then you observe them for a day. So you actually apply a kind of scientific rigor to your measurements and you find that they consume this many. So it's a good start, I suppose, asking people in the form of a survey. What else can we do? Yeah, these are good examples of how we can build it. But remember, we're looking at this idea that reading a text aloud in any language might help to develop our pronunciation skills. We want to know if it's true or not. So just as we considered whether um, the sky is dark at night for one reason or another, we're going to do the same here. Hamid says, I think this is purely subjective and this depends on the student. If they get benefit from that, because in any test, we can only test it on a number of students, which can't speak for the entirety. So I think the teacher can try the method to see if any benefits are shown. Very true. But again, we want to be as objective as possible. And I don't think it is purely subjective. I think that there are ways of doing it. OK, so let me tell you what I did myself then. I was interested about this, so I thought I would try something with my students. I had a group of students who were quite reluctant to speak during the lessons that we had online. And I thought I could maybe use this as an opportunity. If I get them to read something, they will at least practice their speaking. So I gave each of the students a short text. I asked them to read it out loud, but to record themselves speaking. There's a very nice uh, little app on the internet called Vokaroo, and I'll put a link there in the chat. It's a cloud-based service, which means that um, you record on the internet, it generates a link. I got my students to send me the link and then I listened to what they had produced. So I gave them a short text of about a hundred words and I asked each of my students to record themselves speaking. Then I listened to each of the recordings and I counted how many mistakes the students made in their pronunciation. Then over the next six weeks or so, I gave them time to practice reading aloud. They read aloud several times from the same text and then recorded themselves reading that text. Again, they sent me the links. And then at the end of the six weeks, I asked them to record a new text without practice. So can you see the process that I applied there? I started with a test of that selected skill, which was pronunciation. That was the benchmark. That's our starting point. Then I gave them time to practice the skill in the context I found interesting, which was this idea of reading aloud. And then at the end, I gave them another test so that I could compare their performance, the before and the after. I'm going to share some of the results with you now. And this is where we're going to turn our attention more to academic writing, because we're going to use our critical thinking skills to examine the results of this bit of research and see what conclusions we can draw. So I mostly kept the students in groups, and I'm going to show you 
uh, the first of the results here. This is two students. The blue student is S3, the orange student is S4. So I'd like you to look at this and tell me, is it reasonable for me to conclude that the students benefited from reading aloud? The y-axis shows the percentage of the time the student made a mistake in their pronunciation as they were reading aloud. So for example, in the first test, S3, the blue line, started at 20%. That meant that one out of every five words in the text were pronounced incorrectly. At the end of our period, in the final test, only 10% of the words were mispronounced. Is that enough, do you think, for me to be able to say reading aloud improves your pronunciation? Tell me in the chat or if you like, raise your hand and you can speak out loud. Yes, thank you, Fatima Khan. With practicing, the result got better than before. But is there anything else that's happening here? We're going to look at this. We're going to try and think of every possibility, every aspect that might apply here. Yeah, what I think... Uh, uh... Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Should should I share my own experience? Please do. Yes. With yes. My own students. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what I think uh, language is a skill, and skill needs a lot of practice uh, mm -hmm. when you want to develop it. So reading aloud uh, makes student able to uh, practice pronunciation, especially uh, you talked, uh, you told us about software, software you suggested as a software. Mm -hmm. uh, so by reading aloud, students can develop their skills as they practice pronunciation. And uh, whenever they are reading aloud in front of teacher, a teacher can note their, uh, uh, their, their mistakes, their errors, their pronunciation errors. So reading aloud is good, it's a practice. Mm -hmm. Exactly, but like I wanted to know more than that. Yeah. I wanted to be sure of it. Um, so I'll address what you've raised in a moment. First, somebody's asking how to use Volcaroo. So I'll just show the website. I've already linked to it in the chat. Now it's a very simple website, as you can see, there's almost nothing to it. You can upload if you wish, but you don't have to. What I do, or what I did with my students, was I sent them to this website. They simply clicked the record button just here that you can see in the middle. They spoke into their microphone to record themselves speaking. And then it generates a link. They sent the link to me in the chat, and I saved that in a spreadsheet so that I was able to listen to my students later in the class. I didn't want them to read in the class. I had 10 students in the class, and if I waited two minutes for each of the students to read a short text, that would be 20 minutes of the lesson completely lost, and that's too much. So my idea was to use Vokaroo so that they could do it all simultaneously. Instead of taking 20 minutes for 10 students to say something, it only took about two minutes for each student to say something record it here and send the link to me. And it really sped up the process. I was worried otherwise that I would be wasting time in the lesson because what would the other students be doing whilst their peers were um, reading aloud? They wouldn't be listening. There's no chance that they would be listening. Um, so yeah, the question is though, are there any other possibilities? Remember, You've already come up with these great ideas in our Padlet, things like think outside of the box. So look again at this chart. As you can see, the students had an initial test and a final test. And in between the two, they had six practices. 
Is there anything else that you can think could explain the improvement? Uh, Hamid himself has um, added something very valuable, extremely valuable here. Thank you very much. He says that he'd agree that the students definitely showed improvement, but the graph only shows the impact on those two students and that the results gathered with a different group might be different. But I want you to think a little bit more. Think critically. There's something else, um, something that we might be missing. When I asked my students to record themselves the first time, it was novel. It was completely new. It was a new experience for them. Do you think they understood why they were doing it? Fatima, would you like to speak? So obviously they should have like there must be an idea uh, to them that why are they sorry could you repeat that sir they must be having some idea that why are they doing it for uh -huh. the improvements mm -hmm. i would say that maybe they didn't i would agree with both hamid and usman naim who said that at the start they probably had no idea of what they were doing I don't think that they had any idea because a lot of the students in this class <clears throat> simply came to the class. They came to the lessons. These, these are teenage students. I should have perhaps mentioned that earlier. Probably not at the lessons out of choice, probably because their parents had sent them to the lessons. And when you're not mm -hmm. at the lesson out of choice, you don't always think carefully about why you're there or what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Or maybe in the start, they don't know yes. about it. But when they were practicing it uh, again and again, when you told them to practice it, maybe they learned that why uh, are they doing it? Uh, everyone knows their mistakes and faults. So, yeah. I think, no, no, I think you're very close to the idea here. I don't think it's about improvement or about learning. I would say it's no. possible, it's possible to explain this a different way. Uh, Syed? Yes, yes. Uh, sir, I am, I am thinking that uh, the student will uh, reflect on their own work in the best possible way if they are speaking and record, recording their own videos. That's a very optimistic perspective, and I'm not sure if I shared it with all of the students that I teach. But yes, it's very possible. I spoke to one so of these is... students, and he was definitely keen to improve. Please, Fatima, go ahead. Uh, maybe it is because um, you you wanted them to learn how to try again and again until they got perfect in that or got better in that. Yeah. In anything. So the graph also showed the group S4 mm -hmm. in their uh, fifth test. They got about 0% uh, mistakes. I'm and sorry, then, S4. Uh, so S4 is a student, and this is the orange line, yeah? So in the yes. first test, they got about 14% of mistakes. And then went down to zero. Uh, no, and they're never at zero. The zero line is right at the bottom, if you see. Can you see that? So uh, the first test is here, so that's at about 14%. And then the last test is here and it's down at 5%. So on the surface of it, it does look like it's an improvement. So yeah, there are two possible explanations, I would say, maybe more actually, but two that immediately spring to mind. And because we are looking at critical thinking, we need to consider both of those possibilities. The first one is that this idea of the repetition and the additional practice help them develop their skills. Very true. And connected to that is this idea that they were re reflecting more on their abilities. They reflected on the mistakes they made. They reflected on what they were doing, what they weren't doing right. There is another possibility, though, and this is kind of um, experimental bias. As the students became more aware that they were being tested, their natural inclination to work 
so that they could do well in the test became more apparent. If you don't tell a student that this is a test, they won't treat it like a test. They will be uh, less careful, let's say. But when they start to become conscious of the test nature of what's happening, they might pay more attention and try harder. Now, this is something that I can't isolate. But as a critical thinker and as somebody who wants to write academically, I need to think about these things. On the one hand, I can be optimistic and say these great results show that reading aloud works for these students. But on the other hand, I have to accept the fact that perhaps the good results achieved here only come about because the students realized they were being tested. At the start, they had no idea, so they didn't try. At the end, they thought, oh, I think this is a test. I think the teacher is testing us. We better try hard. And that could account for the difference. I have no way of knowing because even if I asked the students, did you think it was because it was a test? Was that why you tried harder? Is that why you did better? They won't know. There's no way for them to know. Let me show you another group. Here I have two students. And as you can see, there are some gaps in the, the chart. And these gaps are because they were absent. The students were absent for some of the lessons. So in this group, um, the blue student S1 started at about 14%. Uh, the orange student S2 started about 13%. And at the end of our period, they achieved results that were broadly similar to at the start. How can I explain this? Is it that their pronunciation was good enough all the time? Is it that they didn't really engage with the practice? Is it that they didn't care to try? How am I to know? What do you think? Sir, uh, there is a famous saying that uh, perfect practice makes the man perfect, but also we need uh, interest in the field. Uh, what we do. In... Sorry, could you please try again? I think what you were saying was very interesting, but I think we lost your microphone connection a little bit. Go ahead. <laughs> So there is connection problem, sir. I am saying that perfect practice makes the man perfect. This is the famous saying. But uh, we have to know about uh, the student uh, who are trying to do something have interest in the field that uh, they have also interest uh, that what he uh, what he he or she is doing. That's very true. Yes, interest and motivation are critical here. And as somebody <laughs> mentioned at the start when we looked at the Padlet. As Maybe somebody the mentioned, it has become a bit critical or difficult for the students. Sorry, once more to wrap. Uh, I mean that maybe the text become a bit difficult for the students, uh, depending on their level. As they go further, the text may become uh, a bit difficult for them. And also, they uh, like uh, uh, previously, the uh, Lareb, I think Lareb mentioned that maybe they uh, they take this thing a bit lighter, uh, they uh, lose their interest. There may be multiple interpretations of There's this. so much, isn't there? That's the, really the heart of this discussion of academic writing and critical thinking is encapsulated in what you've said there. And it comes back to something that somebody wrote in Critical Thinking Padlet earlier, where it opens up a new domain. There's... Uh, on the surface, this seems like a very simple experiment. I wanted to see if reading aloud helped my students improve their pronunciation. But as you've said there, there are so many other things going on. Perhaps as we went through, the texts became more difficult than the students could cope with. Perhaps if the texts at the final test were as easy as in the first test, then the students would have scored 0% mistakes. I chose texts that followed the progressions of the student through the book. So if the students were progressing with the book, 
then they should have found the final test as easy as the first test. But again, that's another assumption. That assumes that the students are progressing from lesson to lesson. What if they're not? What if a student has become static? Mm -hmm. And we do see something like that in the last student, the final student here who had the, the, uh, the most mistakes in the first test also had the most mistakes in the last test. And the last test had the same result, more or less, as the first test. They did better at some times and worse at others. And then the question becomes, is this pronunciation that I'm looking at or is this broader English ability? Could it be that after this test four, practice four, after this, did the text suddenly become too difficult for the student? And I think that it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you very much for raising this point because it shows how broad everything is and how much we can start thinking about every little thing. Everything that we see, when we think critically and we take that idea and we turn it to look in different perspectives, suddenly we discover how enormous the world is and how much there is to understand. And on that point, we reach the end of today's lesson. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your efforts here today. Uh, we still have another minute or so. So if anyone has any urgent questions, I'd be very happy to field them. But otherwise, thank you very much. You've been wonderful students. I've really enjoyed my time with you today. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, so much, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks uh, a lot, sir. Uh, I'm really thankful to uh, Mr. Christopher for his time and for his wonderful lecture. And I'm also thankful to my students from uh, Hazara University, Mansara, uh, from Abbott University of Science and Technology, from Rep University, Islamabad, and as well as students from Government Postgraduate College, Parashinar. Uh, I hope you had uh, a very uh, fruitful session with Mr. Christopher. And uh, inshallah, in future, we will have such fruitful sessions and we will be in contact with uh, Mr. Christopher Walker. And uh, I'm really grateful. Again, I'm really grateful to Mr. Christopher and uh, to all of my students who attended the session. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, I will request uh, to Mr. Christopher to please share these slides with us. And also a lecture will be uh, shared with you people and you can follow uh, him on Facebook, uh, sorry, uh, on Facebook as well. And he has also his YouTube channel uh, uh, uploads his recorded lecture. Uh, so I will, I may share uh, if you uh, allow me, uh, Mr. Christopher. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I will share with you people these slides and this lecture as well. Fantastic. Thank you all very much.